Welcome to Motorcycle Madhouse. I'm James Hollywood Machikari, and first off, I would like to welcome everyone watching on all the many platforms worldwide. We are now broadcasting on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, FC2 in the Southeast Asia, VK in Russia, and Eastern Europe, you now and Breakers TV. I just want to remind everyone watching that if you would like to get in on the live chat during the show, you can join us over on Insane Throttle Motorcycle Magazine's YouTube channel. Today, we are going to discuss police interrogation techniques as well as the recent appeal victory iron order was just handed down concerning their civil case in pennsylvania this case was the civil case in which if won by the plaintiff could have set precedent against all motorcycle clubs Basically, a win on that case would establish motorcycle clubs were responsible for the actions of their members. This would have had a catastrophic effect on one percenter clubs here in the United States. This is something you bet the government would have used to shut clubs down. Huh. The government would have basically been able to achieve through civil courts what they couldn't through that crap RICO law <laughs> and other criminal proceedings. I'll be going through over some of the courts uh, ruling later on in the show. We also have China Dow coming on the show later on to discuss the overreach of officials here in Illinois, as well as the second part of Tombstone's presentation, which was started on the last video. <laughs> it was a good one, a real good one, uh, this past Monday. But first, let's talk about police interrogation techniques. You might be wondering why I would be doing a segment on this. I know those pole smokers who go around claiming, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have anything to worry about. They're going to be crying and whining about this segment. For those of us who care about personal freedom and liberties. This is for them. That's who this is for. You pole smokers, go find a corner to jack off while we're doing grown up things in this segment. Now, there was a video on YouTube which was titled 10 Police Interrogation Techniques. I figured I would use some of its points in this segment because that video got it pretty much right it was dead on when it comes to how cops try and get you to confess to a crime the one thing it didn't talk about was the 17 or the 72 hour hold and keeping your ass up for the entire time it also didn't talk about how the cops like to beat the shit out of you when they don't get what they want it's something I'll cover, though, because it's something you have to know will be coming if you don't have a lawyer sitting right next to you, especially when the crime they are accusing you of is a serious felony. As I go along the different steps of the interrogation process with, you know, remember the number one rule, name birth date, and I want a lawyer. These are the only words which should be coming out of your mouth during any of this process. You will see why I say that as I go along. Oh, first and foremost, you have to remember that this whole process is about psychological warfare. The intent of the interrogation by the cops is to break you down and confess. That is it. They are not your friends, and they sure to hell are not there to help you out of a jam. You want to know why people end up ratting 
or breaking down. They are weak minded and buy into everything the cops say during those interrogations. So, what is the interrogation process? Well, good cop, bad cop. That routine, the prisoner's di uh, dilemma, making false promises of leniency, offering moral and psychological justifications for the crime. <laughs> Police officers use a variety of techniques to extract confections, omissions of guilt, and or incrimination. <laughs> Anything they can do to get you to write a statement. So... Here are the techniques they will use against you. It's pretty universal from state to state. From the gentle and soft to the more manipulative, what you find in Chicago. Uh, the confrontational and, you know, how they, com you know, coerce you. First, we need to distinguish between police interviews and police interrogation. Okay, very important. Interviews and interrogations are two Two, distinct and yet related, sometimes overlapping constructs, you know, generally speaking. The main objective of the interview, the main objective is to collect information and to find out, quote, and <laughs> they want to find the truth and what happened. Uh, <laughs> and on the other hand, Interrogations are conducted for accusational purposes, okay? The objective of the interrogation is to extract in incrimination and incriminating statements, admissions of guilt, and or concessions, okay? In other words, when police officers interrogate a subject, or a, suspe or a suspect or a subject, they have to have a pretty good idea that the suspect is guilty. Or at least they believe the suspect is guilty because they have enough evidence that points to the guilt of the suspect. Remember this. The police will almost never tell you that they're going to interrogate you. They will always say, always say, that they just want to have a word with you. <laughs> yeah, they just want to have a word with you. Have a chat with you, or just ask a couple of questions in order to tie up a few loose ends. In fact, many interrogations actually start with interviewing in order to get the suspect to talk, to get the suspect to give up his or her rights for the police officer to establish what they call a behavioral baseline and for the police officer to establish a rapport with the suspect, okay? So that they can keep the suspect talking again, talking. All right, we're going to get into a little, you know, we are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Let's take a look at some of the most common strategies and their tactics, their techniques, whatever you call them, that police will use to extract com uh, confessions. Remember these. Number one, the pretext phone call. This happens even before the interrogation. The police are going to arrange for the alleged victim or someone related to the victim to call you out of the blue. Okay? Saying something like, if you want to apologize for what you did, then we'll, we will not go to the police or press charges. We just want to hear you say that you're sorry about what happened and that you didn't mean to hurt us. That's going to be the, the uh, initiation of the call. And like that, of course, if you apologize, <laughs> you're stupid. Then the recording of this phone call 
would most likely be admitted in court as your admission of guilt or even as your confession. Don't talk. This can happen even before the police interrogate you. They may already have gotten your incriminating statements, admissions, or guilt, or confession through this pretext of a phone call. Don't do it. The second technique is isolation. This is what Chicago is good at. When it comes to police interrogation, the first thing they're going to do is isolate you. That's the first thing they're going to do. The cop would try to make you feel isolated, basically alone and completely powerless. That's one of them rooms that have no windows or anything. And it's usually small. And again, no windows. You can't see out. There's nothing on the wall, nothing. There's no posters, there's no paintings, no clocks, no nothing, which means there is nothing for you to fix your eyes on. You will have to look and listen to the interrogation, or how can I say it? The interrogator, and most likely you will be seated seated at a corner in the room in a chair that cannot move while the cop would be sitting, and this is very popular in Chicago, in an office chair with wheels so that they can easily move closer to you or farther away from you. Now, this is dependent on the situation. Sometimes the police officer will place you in the interrogation room and just leave you there for uh, a couple hours and I'll, let's just put an ex extended period of time before questioning you. This is to further en enhance your sense of isolation and powerlessness. Number three, they do this all the time. They try to build rapport with you. Frequently, the interrogation begins pretty cool. The police officer, they're going to try to establish rapport with you in order to get you to talk to them. Again, name, birthday, I want a lawyer. They will be, you know what, they're going to begin by asking you casual and friendly questions. Uh, things like... <laughs> How long have you been living in this town? I see you're wearing a basketball hat. Uh, which team do you support? Or, and he'll go back and say, oh, really? Me too. The police officer might offer you food, drinks. Me, I always love cigarettes. Some police officers might even go the extra mile and wear similar kind of clothes as you in order to emphasize similarity and to establish that rapport. They, in, you know what, they're going to interact and chat with you in order to see what you are like when you are relaxed and telling the truth in order to establish a behavioral baseline. This is real important for you guys. Body language. So that all, <laughs> they'll be able to sense when you're tense, you're telling the truth, and when you're not. During this portion of the interrogation, chances are you might feel that the police officer is being genuine. He might uh, seem like a nice person. He might be uh, pleasant with this conversation. And that you might actually feel that you really enjoy talking to this person. Again, that, of course, is what they want you to feel. That is exactly the objective of the rapport building phrase of the interrogation. Number four, waiver of your rights. Don't ever do this. And now, you know what? After you've been chatting with the cop for a while, again, 
Name, birthday, I want a lawyer. The cop is going to say something like this. Well, looks like you want to talk to me. Seems like you're someone I can talk with openly and honestly. I bet, and he's going to say, I bet you're quite eager to tell me what happened. They always say this. And he's going to also say, I'm really interested in knowing your side of the story. Then he's going to say, let's fill out a form. Let's take care of the paperwork. <laughs> they will very nicely and very easily get you to give up or waive your right to remain silent and your right to legal counsel. That's their number one thing to do. That's their goal to start off with. Number five. Open questions. The pleasant tone of the voice will most likely remain throughout the open questions portion of this interrogation. They will ask you open-ended questions to generate as much information as possible so that potential inconsistencies in your statements can be identified and used against you. <laughs> They're not your friends, people. Police officers can get a pretty good sense when you're tense or nervous and uncertain or you're lying about things because they're trained to do this. Body language, people. Because remember, they already established a baseline of your behavior during the rapport building phase of the interrogation. All about body language. This open question interviewing process can vary in terms of length and time. Remember that. Number six, accusation. Then the accusatory process of the investigation or the interrogation will come. The police officer will accuse you of the crime confidentially unwaveringly and repeatedly they will use they're going to say things like we know for a fact that you did it i just want to understand why and you will not be allowed to deny things the police officer will interrupt you with anytime you deny it they're going to interrupt you they will dismiss your denials as impossible and that you contradict yourself to the facts of the case. Essentially, they will not allow you to effectively verbalize any coherent denials or defense. They will say things like, stop denying it. Stop talking. Listen to me. Listen to me now. I will give you the opportunity to talk in just a moment. But right now, it is very important that you listen to me carefully. Why do they say that? <laughs> Why do they tell you that? Why do they tell you you have to listen to them? It's not because they have something on you or they have something important on you, okay? It's rather, it's because the police interrogation technique indicates that the suspect should not have the opportunity to verbalize denials. Next, <laughs> this is the fun one. False evidence ploys. The police officer will confront you with evidence against you. And this is where people fall. Sometimes it's real evidence, sometimes it's fabricated evidence. Most of the time it's fabricated. And that's known as false evidence ploys. They will say that you have that they have your fingerprints or they got your DNA or that they have eyewitness testimonies or they have you on surveillance tapes or they have audio recordings. <laughs> They're, they can say anything. In fact, it is very likely that the police officer who has been questioning you 
has a big folder, and they do it all the time, in okay. front of them with your name on it. They're going to put it right in there and put your name on there. And it's going to make you think that they have all kinds of evidence and papers on you. It's stuff with printer papers, all it is. Then they may also have with them videotapes or CD-ROMs making you think that they have video or audio recordings of you. <laughs> That's a fun one. Yeah, right. Hey, I wasn't there. Even if I was there, I wasn't there. This is all to put psychological pressure on you, and this is all legal. The police is legally permitted to use deceit when interrogating suspects. Remember that. Remember that. Huh, very important. Nine. The ac <laughs> When they accuse you, okay, it's going to culminate with the use of themes, okay? It's going to be a bad theme and a good theme, both of which will say that you committed the crime that you're being accused of. But one says that you did it because you are evil, and the other says because you intended to do so, and because you wanted to cause harm to the victim. Whereas the other theme will say you did it by accident, or you didn't know what you were doing, or you were drunk, or it was a spur of the moment. Better yet, the victim deserved it. <laughs> Whatever, okay? In other words, the good theme offers you moral and psychological justification for the crime. It is just an accident. It's just a mistake. We will all make mistakes. It's no big deal. And if you go along with the good theme, there will be a lesser charge, and the judge will be able to be very lenient on you. When it comes to sentencing, that's what they always throw, the judge, the judge will be more lenient. The good theme is also known as minimization. It minimizes the seriousness of the crime, and it minimizes the charge and punishment. The bad theme, by contrast, is maximization, okay? Maximizing the seriousness of the crime, maximizing the punishment, threatening, uh, you know, threatening you with 100 years, scaring you, you know, it's contrasting effects uh, you know, maximization and minimization associated with a good theme and a bad theme. They're very similar to those of the good cop and bad cop routine. Any rational person in that situation will choose the good theme. So they're gonna throw it out at you. You know, and finally you got the confession. As soon as the police officer said and senses that you're about to stop resisting and go along with a good theme. <laughs> by the way, they can usually tell this again by your body language and your posture. Police interrogations are, you know, these guys are trained to spot the so-called surrender position so that they they can tell you when you're about to break. They can tell. As soon as they sen sense it, you're about to admit guilt or confess, they will move closer to you. They might put a hand on you, kind of nudging you and encouraging you. They will say that you are doing the right thing. And that's one of their favorite things. You're doing the right thing. <laughs> this is the right thing to do. They might bring in another cop at this point to ensure that you do not change your mind about confessing. They might also try to convert your confession into a written one. Never sign anything. 
You know, they're going to be asking you to write things down. They might even trick you into writing an apology letter. I've seen that done to the victim telling you that it's going to be in your favor that if it, you do it, it's going to help you because it's going to make the judge see that you're sorry. Then, of course, the apology letter will actually be recorded as a written confession. Don't be stupid. So it's really important to understand these people in the room are not your friends. Cops are there to manipulate you and wear you down. The only goal they have is to break you. The question, will you allow them to break you? Let's step back for a moment. Now, after hearing the process of interrogation, can you see where most people start to flip? Leave your answer in the comment section for me. And remember, don't ever confess. Get a lawyer in there, your birthday, okay? So we're gonna take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're gonna go on to the latest on the dismissal of the Iron Order case in Pennsylvania. We will discuss why it's a good thing for the rest of the motorcycle club scene, even if you don't like the Iron Order. You have to know the importance of the decision. So with that, uh, let's take a quick commercial break and I'll be right back. If you're looking for up-to-date biker news, then Insane Throttle is the place to be. Daily editorials and news that is dedicated to the biker scene. Come on over and join the number one internet biker news site at HarleyLiberty.com. Hi, this is James Hollywood Machikari. Join our YouTube channel and get motorcycle madhouse and tons of videos related to the biker scene. Join now by subscribing for free and become part of the crowd today. And welcome back. Let's dive right into the decision handed down in the Iron Order civil case in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia Court of Cummins, the judge, his name was Kenneth Powell, issued a 30-page last week outlining the granting of a non-compulsory suit against the Iron Order Motorcycle Club, which had been facing liability in connection with the 2015 bar brawl that left Tanya Fock dead. A Pennsylvania judge is defending his finding that a nationwide motorcycle club should not face liability over a fatal bar brawl that led to a nearly $10 million verdict last year. Philadelphia Court of Commons uh, Judge Kenneth Powell, he did issue the 30-page opinion last week and outlining his reasons for granting it. Now, this was a huge case. Uh, the Iron Order Motorcycle Club was facing a liability in the connection of that 2015 bar brawl. And... Powell's decision to let the club out of the case, it's called Bollinger vs. Iron Order Motorcycle Club, is currently on appeal to the state superior court. Now, although Fox Estate, which had sued several Iron Order Motorcycle Club members involved in the fatal fight, contended that those defendants were acting as agents of a national or the national club nationwide. That's real important right there. Powell said the plaintiff was, quote, making mountains of molehills, end quote, when it came to the connections between the national club and the members who participated in the fight. And he goes on to say, this court could not allow appellant to twist and contort the meager facts of this case so that she could summon, and this is important, a reckoning day for motorcycle clubs, which is what she sought to do. And the judge went on to say, this is a case about a bar fight involving a group of individuals acting alone, based purely on personal animosity towards each other and nothing more. According to the court records, including the pre-trial memo of Brenda Bollinger, who is the administrator of Fox Estate, 
The fatal bra took place on June 19, 2015, when Fock and her fiance arrived at Anna Anna's bar. It's a barbecue pit near uh, Reading to meet friends for the dinner. Uh, several members of the Iron Order Motorcycle Club began to accost them verbally and physically. Now, that's according to what the court papers said. And although the two attempted to leave, the members followed them into the restaurant's parking lot where the conflict escalated. Now, again, according to court papers, uh, those court papers also said Fox fiance was wrestled to the ground where the members of the club began to pummel him. Fox tried to help her fiance, but one of the club members named Timothy Martin allegedly punched her in the face, which knocked her backward and into the side of a moving SUV. Again, according to court papers. According to the court papers, the vehicle crushed Fox skull. Fox estate sued the restaurant on alleged negligence on you know dram shop violations it also sued the iron order motorcycle club and several members of the club involved in the fight on claims that they were negligent and reckless the plaintiff also made a wrongful death and survivorship claims in july a Philadelphia jury awarded $9.7 million to Fox Estate, but midway through the trial, Powell granted the Motorcycle Club's motion for non-pulsory non-suit. In contesting Powell's decision, Fox Estate noted that Martin was a sergeant at arms for the club that the National Club provided legal counsel and that the club provided training to its members on tactical responses. You see how this is starting to tie in for everybody right now? However, Powell said that the evidence showed a strong division, this is important, between the national and local chapters, including a separate bank account and paying separate taxes. He also said training was done on the local level. The local chapter makes decisions about who becomes a member, not the national. The local chapters investigate potential members for suitability. And Martin did not hold any position in the national organization. Powell added that some of the evidence the plaintiff sought to introduce contained lurid material and had pugilistic language and also noted that the parties involved in the fight knew each other this is something we didn't know before they knew each other including fox fiance who testified that his ex-wife had an affair with one of the people involved in the fight she had an affair with one of the members with all this personal baggage and animus between this group of people, it is difficult for this court to surmise how appellant believes this case represents anything more than a personal bar fight that escalated. Now that was quote from a judge. Again, Powell said, however, the evidence showed a strong division between the national and local chapters, including having separate bank accounts and paying separate taxes. Very important for the rest of the clubs. One percenters, everything, this, uh, this uh, thing. He also said the training was done on a local level. The local level uh, chapter makes decisions about who becomes a member. And they're also the ones who investigate members for suitability. That is hugely and frick important because on a national level, I don't care if you don't like the iron order or any of this. That right there is important to hear. Why? Because the national club is not responsible for individual members. Individual members. 
and right now the Mongols are actually going through something. They lost on the Rico. We got first. They got uh, First Amendment grounds right there. So that's great. But there's another judge on the East Coast saying, yeah, you know, there's no connection between nationals and you know how can you do that kind of stuff? You can't. And that's something that the clubs needed from another judge. Okay, it, it, it was a personal bar fight that escalated. Now, plaintiff's uh, counsel Slade McLaughlin said that he thought the issue was one the grand or the jury should have been allowed to consider. He said the judge barred him from introducing evidence of other violent acts allegedly perpetrated by Iron Order chapters and writings that he indicated the National Club was promoting a culture of violence. And he went on to say, Judge Powell said the language and lured and pugilistic that's what was the language, but that's too kind of a description. The pugilistic language is really egregious. And that's what uh, the plaintiff's attorney said. It's a very violent code of conduct, a very unforgiving code of conduct, and something the members are supposed to follow. It's no coincidence. They're controlled from above. And he added that he thought arguments that the fight was simply a bar brawl could have been made by <laughs> the organization at trial. See, they wanted to get the club in the trial, but Powell should have allowed him to introduce the evidence. That was his main bitch. And the counsel for the club, Brian Grady of uh, Ed, Elliot and Greenleaf, said it is definitely a law-abiding club. There's that law-abiding club. That's where it hurts them all the time. Uh, the writings the plaintiff sought to produce, he said, are about the conduct of other so-called out other outlaw motorcycle clubs that may seek to clash with law-abiding clubs like the Iron Order. Uh, Powell uh, Grady said, got it absolutely right. Uh, Judge Powell, he said, painstakingly listened to all the evidence and very thoroughly and thoughtfully made the correct legal decision. One thing that hasn't come out until now, like I said earlier, is the parties in the fight knew each other. Fox fiance who testified that his ex-wife had an affair with one of the people involved in the fight. That's a brainstormer of a revelation right there. So tell me how the National Club could be held liable for that fight. Tell me. I'm not only talking about Iron Order. I'm talking about major one percenter clubs in the Iron Order shoes. This is a problem with supporters or people who just have no idea what the hell they are talking about. You mean to tell me you would be all right if the court found in favor of the plaintiff? In other words, a club was responsible for one or two members' actions just because they wear the same patch. Better yet, if you're a club member, would you be all right having to kick in extra dues because a judgment was leveled against your club for something you had no part in? Let that sink in a little bit. Here's the way people should start looking at this case. Remove the iron order. Get them out of there. Remove them. You know, put in your favorite club. Now tell me you're pissed about off about the outcome. Yeah, I didn't think so. Listen, I've been the only major biker news publication advocating for the Iron Order to win this thing. Why? It's not because I like freaking Iron Order. It's because I don't want to see this tactic used on major 1% clubs. Let's take it a step further. 
the Mongols were able to win the decision to keep the government from taking their trademarks and their logos. That was a criminal trial, people. A criminal one. The government has been after the Mongols for over 10 years now. Do you really think now that they have a RICO verdict, the same DA won't try the civil crap on them? So how does the, you know, the decision and explanation help the Mongols? And I'm going to quote him again. Powell said that the evidence showed a strong division between the national and local chapters, including having separate bank accounts and paying separate taxes. He also said the training was done on the local level. The local level makes decisions about who becomes members. The local chapters investigate potential members for their suitability, and Martin did not hold any position in the national organization. Those were the magic words that needed to be in an opinion. Chapters act on their own, and thus, the rest of the club cannot cannot be held liable as a whole. Here's one thing that I'll never forget. You have some biker news sites acting just like the mainstream media in the way they report stuff. You would think bikers of all people had enough of the propaganda BS. Again, I get it. People hate the Iron Order, and boy, has the Iron Order gave them a reason to. But when something like this, which could affect the whole MC scene as a, as a whole, is reported from some on a damn conspiracy angle, give me a break. You had someone who claims to be for motorcycle clubs, and for the scene, write in an affidavit against a motorcycle club in a case that could have hurt everyone. That right there burns my ass because hundreds of clubs nationwide could have felt the shockwaves from this decision if it went the other way. What is their explanation on why they did it? Well, it's Iron Order, so screw them. How freaking ignorant can you be? You're either a club advocate or you're not. You're either going to present the news to the biker community without a slant or you're not. If the answer is going to be you're going to slant it so you can gain some popularity contests, then move down the road. You're not helping motorcycle clubs. You're freaking hurting them. I think I speak for a ton of people when I say not everything is a conspiracy. In order to address the motorcycle profiling that is rampant against motorcycle clubs, we have to be honest. We have to be an honest, we have to be honest in how we report. Maybe, just maybe, we will be able to make a difference and our, keep our credibility as a new industry. Let's face it, anyone with a keyboard now can spout off a bunch of anti-Leo crap. Yes, people will flock to the material because most people cannot stand Leo. But if you want to be taken serious as a media platform, it can't always be the government's fault. In order to make changes, all sides must see the wrong they are doing and correct it. That doesn't happen wearing tinfoil hats. For Christ's sake, the propaganda war is being won by the government because normal everyday bikers and enthusiasts are buying into motorcycle clubs are criminal. Why? Because the last 10 years we've seen nothing but garbage out of Hollywood coming out about the lifestyle. 
Combine the fact with the piss poor conspiracies and editorials, and the ball game is almost lost. I've been asked over and over again why Insane Throttle shares mainstream uh, news stories on our site that depict clubs in a bad light. The reason's simple. Those stories are the ones the general public are seeing. People who could care less about the biker scene. I know. Who cares about the general public, right? You better. They're, those are the ones who sit on juries and vote on the pricks who make the laws. Hearts and minds, people. Hearts and minds. What do you think those citizens think when they hear some club went and shot another club? They just get reinforcement of what they've been hearing and seeing coming out of Leo and Hollywood movies like Sons of Anarchy and all that crap. So why do I put up with them? I put up with that in the hopes clubs will see what's happening and hopefully things on the street will change. One bitch I hear all the time is when media refers to clubs as gangs in their articles. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate here. What the hell else do you want the, them to call it? Someone just got shot or blown up. Someone else yeah, because they're from opposite clubs. Sorry to say some gang ass shit right there. At least where I'm from. My favorite saying to those who bitch about the article is very simple. Stay out of the news and you won't have to worry about being plastered all over the 5 o'clock news. <laughs> Come on. And sites like Insane Throttle, sorry, we're going to print the news. One thing you can always bet, though, when it comes from Insane Throttle we are down the middle and report what's happening, regardless of what clubs are involved. If it, that pisses anyone off, then I don't know what to tell you. No, wait, 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 wait. My question would be to those people, would you rather a biker news organization report facts or play the conspiracy card and lose all credibility? If credibility is lost, then how do we move forward with fighting motorcycle club uh, profiling and biker profiling? I'm telling you, here and now, we won't be able to. Shit. Look at CNN. They went off on this bullshit Russia crap for over two years. Conspiracy after conspiracy. Well, it all came crashing down when it was announced that there was no collusion, no obstruction. Now that station is not even in the t top 20 anymore, which means it doesn't have the reach for its viewership to get the message out. Same thing is true with biker news sites. Who the hell wants to read nothing but conspiracy and garbage? People are not stupid. And these sites shouldn't treat them as such. Oh yeah, when reporting and giving editorials, you're not supposed to be the story. When that happens, all it does is kill the credibility you have with your audience. For example, in this Iron Order case, the judge wrote in his opinion, the language was lurid and pugilistic, but that's too kind of a description. The pugilistic language was, <laughs> come on. I totally freaking agree. Why? Because I read the affidavits that people submitted. One from a guy who runs a biker and editorial site, and the other a damn international president of the club. He used to be. He was put out on bad. The shit they put on paper was laughable, and a normal person could see the bias. They were called out for being morons. <laughs> if you want to read the affidavits, click on the link in the description box. You will see these supposed expert witnesses in action. 
it's no wonder they were not allowed to testify. We're the clubs who are trying to use these so-called experts. First, an expert has to have credibility in the courtroom, which the numbnuts who participate in this case do not. Shit! All the other side had us to do is pull their affidavits of this case and they will tear their asses up in court. So be freaking careful. And secondly, you don't want to use people who are reporters or editorial writers for a witness. I've been asked many times to appear on behalf of a motorcycle club. And I won't do it. Here's the reason why. Because I will not become a part of the story. Plus, it's not my place to give testimony. To be blunt, I'm just a radio show host that covers the biker scene. Yes, I'm a hardcore motorcycle club activist, but the truth is, I run an entertainment forum. Sure, I give clubs a voice when they need it, but I'm not no expert. I've turned down offers to be in an opinion correspondent for USA Today, New York Times, and Fox News. And why? Because I'm not that person. Sure, I've been interviewed in dozens of uh, news articles from around the world. But those interviews were generalized and censored, you know, it's centered on motorcycle profiling. That's my interest. My interest is not talking about why this club and that club got into some brawl. Those are the subjects these news organizations wanted a standby correspondent on, and I won't do that. No, not at all. Screw that. You know, a quick story, and I'll get back on topic here. I was contacted by a representative from the History Channel. They wanted me to come on a show that was highlighting one of the major 1% clubs. Why in the hell would anyone want to do that in the first place? That's my first uh, question. I continued by saying their Gangland series already put clubs in a bad enough light and nothing more than that's what they were. They were shock, ba uh, shock value. That's all they were. So I politely told the rep to screw off. Why in the hell would anyone who supports motorcycle club rights be seen on anything to do with the History Channel? That right there is beyond me. But anyways... Let's wrap this up real quick. The important thing when looking at things which affect the club scene is to stay neutral. If someone has is too busy hating on one club or another, they will always blind themselves to the good of the entire scene. It's funny. If you go look at the article about this outcome we put out on this case, you will find almost everyone who commented on it as Iron Order got away with it again. That is where I really shake my head in disbelief. People cannot even comprehend the damage which could have been done to the whole scene if this case went the other way. Why? Because they can't stand Iron Order and everyone wants to see them taken down. Well, if that happened, in this case, it wouldn't have only taken the Iron Order down. It would have been all the major 1%er clubs. Same ones everyone claims to support. Now think about that for a minute. Think about it. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, we're going to take a quick commercial break and uh, we're gonna, we got a bunch of stuff coming up. We got uh, China Dow coming, we got uh, Tombstone stuff, and later on I'll take your phone calls on uh, the subjects that we've been covering here. So stay tuned and, uh, you know, I'll be right back. Don't forget to subscribe, by the way. If you haven't uh, subscribed to one of our platforms, hit that uh, subscribe button. Everything's free. We never charge. I'll be right back. This is 
Ruben Roman, yep, big the boy in the Cycle Tribe Chronicles. Hey, this is Ruben Roman, yep, big the boy. Yep. 20 years later, seven albums and the same amount of tours, and, and here I am, man. And welcome back from the commercial break. We have China Doll on the China Chat. Every week we're going to be having her on the Madhouse instead of her own little thing until we get her used to this stuff. But today we're going to talk about some stupid stuff that Illinois passed. And I'm getting sick of the liberal commie Democrats passing this kind of stuff. They just passed as of July 1st a law where you have to be 21 to smoke. Yeah, you gotta be 21 now to pick up a cigarette. Now, I know it's PC and all that stuff out there, uh, but yeah, I can't see a kid going fighting for his country at 18 years old, 17 years old, uh, and you can't have a cigarette. It is just getting plain ridiculous. And also yesterday, see, you know, this Big, uh, how can I say, uh, Butterball got elected on the promise that he would make 420 legal in Illinois. Now, all of a sudden, there's all kinds of problems with that. But first, we're going to get China's opinion on the new cigarette law. Tobacco 21. Tobacco 21. Mm. We are the eighth state in the United States to pass this law. We are the first state in the Midwest. Well, there's two sides of the coin to this one. Number one, if I started smoking when I was 15, so I guess it's for those parents that don't want their kids to smoke, it's a good thing. But Well, we don't want our kids to smoke, but still, that don't mean take away everybody's rights. Go ahead. Very true. But then again, both our kids think smoking is disgusting. Which is cool. Which is great. Um, but like Hollywood said... You can go fight a war, but you can't go buy a pack of cigarettes. Right. Which makes no sense to me. And one thing that don't make sense is Illinois is always, you know what, they become worse than California in my eyes. They always got to pass these bullshit P, uh, you know, PC laws. Now, we live right on the state line. We're like five minutes from Wisconsin. And they can go right over to Wisconsin, and now those businesses, they, they get the sales where Illinois businesses won't. And I know from, from working at a gas station here in Illinois, we're going to lose a lot of sales because majority of our sales are 18 to 20, buying them Swisher Sweets because we all know they don't really smoke them as is. They 420 it. They 420 the Swishers. And... Uh, we're going to lose out on a lot of sales. That and Jewel Pods, because Jewel Pods, they come in and buy them because they're small, they're compact, and the kids hide them in their hand when they go to school because they look like, you know, a little... Actually, I bought one just to see what the big deal was, you know, because they look like little USB ports. And we're going to lose a lot of money, and all they have to do is drive five minutes, go to Wisconsin, and buy them there. Right. And if you're wondering why, you know, because with the China Chat segment, we're going to, you know, get off on other areas other than biker stuff. But I still believe that it's important for bikers to get involved in the politics of things, because what's happening here in Illinois and on the East Coast and these liberal states and in California, they're killing businesses. And a lot of these laws don't make sense. It's like they want to be a Gestapo. They want to be Nazi Germany. They think socialism works. And, uh, you know, I know China's not into this stuff, but as you've seen today, actually, as I'm recording this, the Attorney General came out and said there was no collusion, no obstruction of justice. Well, we all knew that. You know, the Democratic Party is not the party that uh, we once grew up with. You know, I was a freaking blue dog, a Democrat. They are no way uh, in line with that anymore and they're just passing these laws where it's costing businesses everything and it's just not the cigarette laws it's uh, the taxes you know these guys want to raise the taxes through the roof and it's funny when I hear a democrat come out and say well the rich have to pay their fair share of the taxes I always come back and say well did you get a refund this year you don't you know 80% of the people in this country do not pay taxes. 
And that's one thing that's overlooked when they got these talking points out there. Yeah, the rich are the ones paying everything. <laughs> Give me a break. And they want them to pay more and more because it's a talking point. But when you go and start making a law like this, you got to be 21 to do this, 21 to do that, 21 to do this. What, what kind of society are we becoming? Well, isn't there a thing where under 21 can even drink in Wisconsin with an adult? Yeah, with an adult. That's why I love Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin, kill, it's, they're killers up there, man. You got to love the way they do things. And, and to my understanding, the reason why Wisconsin doesn't want to pass a tobacco 21 is because of their 420. Yeah, they're thinking about passing the 420 up For there. For 18 and over. And, you know, I'm a big 420 advocate. Everybody knows that. Anybody, you know what? You want to laugh one of these days i'm gonna get china Dow high for the, the show <laughs> it is some funny stuff let me tell you seeing china Dow high you know i remember uh what was it a couple years ago you know i slipped you a joint you know some good stuff because i got medical see i can buy you know pot here in illinois because i'm on the medical thing and <laughs> we got her high on some blue dreams and boy we were driving down uh, one of the highways and uh she was out there all screaming out you know paranoid and what was that look out it's the fuzz <laughs> she is hilarious when it comes to 420 you know what i got a couple pictures and i'm paying her back for one she just put on instagram of her being drunk Okay, laying on the floor, passed out, all kinds of drunk. But she is funny <laughs> as hell high. So we got to get her smoking on the air. <laughs> Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that perm rod picture is looking better and better. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> You know, I can't see how, you know, one thing I do like about Trump is he carries through with his campaign promises. This JB Butterball guy, you know, goes out there and says, hey, we're going to make 420 legal. Nice thing you know. And it's the Democrats, because there's a super majority here, with all their special interest groups that are, you know, campaigning against it now. What happened to people in Congress and in as your representatives representing the people, over 66% of people in the state of Illinois want legalization of 420. They want it. So give it to them. Give it to the people. Personally, it'll help. You know, I like one of the provisions where you can grow your own. <laughs> I, I grow some good shit, don't I? <laughs> anyway, uh, so... Yeah, you know, it's getting ridiculous with these representatives, and uh, we got to get involved in the program. But 21, what do you think of that? You know, yeah, I don't want my kids smoking and stuff, but I also don't want it to be legislated out. I think everybody over the age of 18 should have the right to choose. Well, you know, they give them the right to vote, but they don't want to give them the right to smoke. You know, it... it God, Jesus, we were watching, what was it, some movies from the 80s. See, I'm a big 80s fan. I love the 80s. Yeah, I grew up in the 80s. You know, it was a different time period than it is now. I actually, if I had a time machine, I'd want to be stuck in the 80s because now it just sucks. It's too PC for me. People are freaking ridiculous. Uh, you know, it... Take that point. People are ridiculous. We put up a, you know, we covered that uh, unveiling of Purple Rain. It was a bike built by kids. A Harley Davidson built by kids. It wasn't built like the other one. Because the Battle of the Kings, they can bring in anybody they want to build their bikes. Well, this bike was built by the kids over in Hampshire High School. And the shit that was coming out of people's mouths. I don't like this, or it's supposed to be this way. The kids built it, people! <laughs> the kids built it, not adults, not professional bike builders, high school students. And they did the best job I have ever seen, and they were so proud of that bike when we went and met with all of them. Everybody should be out there voting for that bike. Oh, Purple Rain, man. You know, uh, we all complain about kids these days always being on Xbox or always being on computers. Well, these kids are over in shop learning how to build a Harley Davidson, man. 
These are the generations we're always bitching and complaining about. But then when they do something good, you got idiots out there making wisecracks, man. <laughs> I can't believe the one person that brought up Prince. Mm. Purple Rain? Well, yeah, Prince rode a motorcycle. And if you ever watch the movie Purple Rain with Prince... He rode in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's not that. It, it, it's the the snide comments, especially on the bigger media platforms we're on. It was, well, I don't like uh, this and I don't like that. This should have been this and that. What do you expect from a 16-year-old kid? <laughs> 16 and 17-year-old kids, they did the best job I've ever seen. I think they can totally compete with all the adults out there. And the other bikes are being made by actual bike builders that yeah, have they been brought doing in, it for years. They brought, them in, they brought in actual bike builders to build their bikes. Professionals. These kids aren't professionals. And that's one thing, you know, that's false advertisement on the part of Harley Davidson where they say, you know, they team up with, uh, you know, local shop or uh, local vocational programs and stuff. It, no, they were bringing in freaking pros, man. And you can tell with some of these bikes who the pros are and who, who weren't. And that's something that if Harley Davidson's going to keep going with the Battle of the Kings, that they need to address. Hey, you use dealership personnel with the kids. No outside freaking consultations. None of that dumb shit. If you want it to be about the kids, then be about the kids. Let the kids do the welding. Well, that's just like on Purple Rain. They uh, purposely on the exhaust left, left it the uncovered. Left it uncovered. The welds that the kids did, and I thought that was the perfect thing. And I'd be, you know, somebody needs to go buy Purple Rain for those kids, man. I told Brian, man, they better get their cut. Yeah, they better get a cut out of that. <laughs> but come on, people, with the PC stuff and trying to be ignorant, man. When you got something good like this going on for kids, don't be a bunch of pricks. <laughs> you know, I... I oh. <laughs> Too much politically correct crap. Well, that and people have to try to put their viewpoints in all the time. You know, ain't that that old saying, if you don't have nothing nice to say, don't, don't say, say it at shit. all? Shut the <laughs> hell up, man, with your freaking critique and a bike made by 16-year-old kids. You're crazy, man. You know what? You need to go get a life or either that. You need to go get in the corner, you know, stroke your freaking cock a little bit or, you know, do what you got to do. Have your old lady tell you what to do, whatever. But don't go after the kids, man. That is freaking utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. You know, that kind of upsets me because, you know, I, you know, the kids are the ones who are making up our future and you got people out there being pricks about it. Too much judgment. Right. The kids need, the kids need to be praised, not downgraded. Well, it's funny. These people have passed judgment, but they probably never picked up a wrench in their life. Probably not. They <laughs> probably couldn't even change their own oil on their bike. Right. Well, another thing that uh, came out, imagine if you had your motorcycle at a shop being serviced, and next thing you know, the doors close on the dealership. Just out of the freaking blue. This happened in Janesville, Wisconsin at Board Tracker, where I bought my bike. What? That was the dealer that put a business close sign. Now, they say it's only temporary, but... I don't buy into it because the this dealership has been uh, involved in some major lawsuits with the company. They were taking product, not paying for it. And yeah, imagine if you did that. I know one thing would happen. A Molotov cocktail would fly right through the freaking window if my bike was there and I'd grab that sucker. But uh, news is that they had somebody there yesterday for people to pick up their bikes. But that is just unimaginable if you had to go through an experience like that. Bikes are being held hostage. Basically, yeah. And, you know, you know, there's crazy people out there. It's going to go right through the window. So, Border Tracker, get them their bikes back. But uh, what do you think about 420 and illegalizing it? Everybody has the right to do what they need to do. And a lot of people are doing it for medical reasons. A lot of people are doing it just because, which there's more of the just because, I'm sure. But you know what? 
it's your choice. You want to do it? Do it. I think they should make it legal so then there's not so many issues with it. Well, that and, you know, there's never been once in recorded history an overdose from weed. Never once. No, I don't see that happening. If anything, you're going to overeat. <laughs> That's what you do, man. <laughs> she get high, and boy, the Doritos, man. They can't, or the cheese puffs. Cheese puffs. You can't keep them on the freaking shelf with her when she's high. But, uh, you know, the legalization of 420, it's got to happen. You know, Canada's already did it, and... You know, the United States, they need to get the pricks off the freaking pharmaceuticals' hands and get this done for the people. Because people are really getting sick of it. This country is going in a bad direction as it is through its politics. But, you know, how can anybody freaking, you know, make a plant illegal? It's unreal to me. You know what I mean? And, you know, look at how many deaths are caused each day by alcohol. Each day. <laughs> DUIs. DUIs left and right. Accidents. Killing people. But hey, weed. You're and on 420 90% of the time. You're at home. You ain't going driving after that. Man, that, <laughs> uh, you know what? It, it depends if it's sativa or it's indica. Ooh. See, I give you indica. You know, because I like seeing her laugh. She all goofy and shit. You know, when she's high, she's funny as hell. I'm telling you, I'm going to get her high. And, uh, you know, the whole time we've been around, that's all I've ever done It was 420. I never drank. You know, I stopped drinking in 97. And mm -hmm. You, you know, stopped drinking when I was eight months pregnant with Brittany. Yeah. She's, and she's now 22. Yeah, she's now 22. So it's been a long time with the drinking. Screw that shit. Uh, you know, me and Jack Daniels, you know, got my ass kicked. But, uh, uh yeah, I've been on 420 my whole life, so, but uh, that is the segment for China Chat. What do you guys think? Go ahead and put your uh, comments in the comment uh, box below, especially about assholes that go out there and uh, try to critique a 16, 17-year-old's kid's build. You know, I like, guess some common sense, people. Stop being a bunch of pricks. You got anything left to say? <laughs> Vote for Purple Rain! There you go. <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and after uh, the commercial, we're going to see uh, Tombstone's second part of his presentation, and uh, I'll be right back after that. I'd like to invite everyone to check out my new books, The New Age of Viking and Brotherhood, and the number one new release in the transportation history category, Iron Order Motorcycle Club, the year that changed the motorcycle club scene. You will get a no-nonsense look at the current happenings in the scene. Both titles are available on paperback and Kindle through all major retailers, as well as an audio version of both of the books on Insane Throttle Publishing. Rock on! That's In addition to that, like I said before, if you were not a registered member of the AMA, they considered you an outlaw. Because of the natural circular design of the original back patch, when cut into three distinct pieces, the top and bottom rocker are curved, and legend has it that the club stayed with the curved rockers because of the, if you place them back together again, its original configuration, it formed a big O, which stood for outlaw a consistent reminder that they were the ones who lived outside of the law and defied the AMA. During the explosive period, clubs were looking for any and every way to scuff in the face of AMA to include cutting the patches, cutting denim, chopping bikes, and giving away trophies in the worst of the worst instead of the best of show. All right, look, I can't even get into the whole letter O thing and all that other bullshit because it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out if you take the center of the patch out, it's an O. Yay! All right, so here's the thing. The three-piece patch set is not, and I repeat, is not the signification of an outlaw or one percent club. It is the diamond. The diamond that has the one percent marker on it. That is what makes somebody a one percenter or an outlaw, okay? 
Um, that is the main signifier. And as far as chopping up the bikes is concerned, we kind of already went into it with the modification thing, but the Hollister event had absolutely no bearing on that. These are the things that veterans did returning from home when, they, you know, they, they were doing these things to their bikes because they wanted to be different and they wanted to show that they were the masters of their own life. I mean, hell, they just got back from one of the worst experiences a person could ever go through. And chopping up a bike was just another way of them showing that they had no fear of death. Uh, they were challenging the devil every day to just come and get them. Next paragraph. Outlaw clubs are traditional motorcycle clubs. Traditional meaning all male on American brand motorcycles wearing a three-piece patch. Too often in today's MC culture, there are a number of clubs who wear three-piece patches without being an outlaw club. These clubs often wear a three-piece configuration and are co-ed club or ride for motorcycles or both. This is wrong from a traditional, from a traditional uh, standpoint and only those that fit the mold of an outlaw club should wear the outlaw configuration. Tag, I'm it. This is one paragraph that really kind of set me on edge, and uh, this is kind of where I lost my shit. I mean, it's one thing to be uneducated about history, but it's another thing to start professing your stupidity, okay? So, and it really bothers me because this is coming from a group that claims to educate people on the way things are in the, in the culture, and in all honesty, this is just irresponsible, uh, arrogant, and, and it's pretty much slightly dangerous to be putting out in the public, especially for new bikers who are just learning about this lifestyle. So let's get into it. There were many other clubs around in the world besides the ones that attended Hollister, three of which I'll mention, the Outlaws MC, which is said to have started in 1936, an all-female club called the Motor Maids MC, which started in 1940s, and another all-female club called the Tracy Gear Jammers uh, that actually participated in Hollister and raced in the events. So what the author is implying is, is that if your club is not a 1% slash outlaw club, then you have no business wearing a three-piece patch set. What he needs to do is actually do some research about the culture. Traditional clubs overall started in the early 20s, and they started off with a family concept. Uh, your woman was welcome to join in the events and uh, enjoy the fun, but for the most part, they kind of existed on the fringe of the lifestyle, uh, mainly because it's in the 20s and 30s, etc. It was uh, the world was basically run by men for the most part. Uh, women were more subservient and, for lack of a better term, accepted that role in life. Things are not that way anymore. Motorcycle clubs need to learn how to change with the culture and accept what is happening around them. So what? There are women in clubs now. I know some women that would probably beat the author's ass. Females have been in clubs since the 40s. So who is this guy to talk shit about any club? Clubs in the late 40s was about expanding the idea of friendship into family. They would race and party all weekend together. And when I say together, I don't just mean the one club. I mean all of them. They didn't have issues between each other about territories and all the other happy horse shit. It was all about building a family and, and being together and showing respect to each other. According to Sonny Barger in his book, uh, some members of traditional clubs also rode BSAs and Triumph motorcycles, uh, though they were a little bit harder to find, but they absolutely existed in the motorcycle club culture. Now, I personally ride a foreign motorcycle because I refuse to support a company that has turned their back on America. The one company that prospered off the concept of American made and American pride gave this country the big middle finger and then walked away. So who's really wrong here? Me, the veteran of this country, or Harley Davidson that sold out an entire country. Having a locked in attitude about only riding American bikes in this day and age is actually pretty petty. Looking back, certain clubs only allowed white American men in them, but now they're accepting all kinds of races and nationalities, specifically Germans and the Japanese, but still cling to the specific type of bike. So clinging to the American made concept Shouldn't you be more worried about the person and not the inanimate object? The true definition overall of outlaw was a club that turned their backs on the AMA. I have no problem supporting this because that's what the AMA did when they turned their backs on specific clubs that didn't fit their normal mode of operandi. And they tried to punish them because those clubs refused to register with them. 
What the author of this post is doing is actually implying that the term outlaw means something else, something more nefarious than what it was intended to be. I have two more questions for you and I really need you to think about the answers before you provide them. If only outlaw clubs, meaning something much more than what it was intended to be per the definition, are allowed to wear a three-piece patch set, then can someone please explain the Booze Fighters MC, which started in 1946. They are not a 1% outlaw club, and they wear three-piece patches. And uh, the other thing is, is they're still around today. So if somebody could please answer that for me, that would be greatly appreciated. And then the very last question I have is, what the true definition of a 1% slash outlaw club is? Thanks for joining me. I had a great time. Have a great evening. Call in now, 312 809 And that is Tombstone right there with uh, his report. And how's everybody doing out there? It is 420. And, uh, yeah, we had China Dow on, and I will get her high for you and get her dancing for you. But uh, it is a beautiful day out here in uh, Illinois. After the show, I'm going to be getting my ass out there and riding myself. But uh, a lot of subject matter here uh, covered today. The Iron Order case, uh, also the uh, interrogation techniques. Uh, now, somebody just asked me personally what I thought about uh, women in clubs. I don't believe in it. Uh, I'm just the old school uh, type of guy. Uh, you know, it was uh, put the women on the back and that's the way it was. But uh, if you guys want to go ahead and call in real quick, uh, 312-889-6720. Or if you want to talk about anything that's happened on the show today, you're more than welcome. Uh, good news, good news. The podcast is now been remastered. All the episodes put back up. Season 2, Episode 1 has been put up today. Every Sunday, you will be able to, to go ahead over to Spotify, iTunes, and all that good stuff and get Motorcycle Madhouse and take it along with you on your motorcycle ride. Jeff, how you doing, buddy? What kind of sandwich, huh, Lori? <laughs> Kitty Cat, what's up there, girl? How you doing? Doing, hun. Uh, oh, look at that. I got uh, China Dowen here dancing behind me. I didn't even have to get her high. <laughs> she all goofy today, man. Maybe later on you give me a lap dance or some shit. Anyway. <laughs> There's China now. Now you, know, you can only expect what she does when she's high. But, uh... <laughs> that was funny shit right there but uh anyway uh if you want to go ahead and call in you can i'll give it a couple minutes if not we're going to be ending the show right there and uh again monday we're going to be talking about lane splitting and we're also going to be talking about harley davidson and uh you know are they still the king of the road you know, big question, big question. But uh, anyway, guys, uh, looks like that's it. I'm going to head out, go over there. I might get some video out there on the road. And uh, really appreciate you guys joining in across all the networks. Again, go ahead and check us out on Spotify if you want to take us with you for your ride. We are also on Apple iTunes, uh, all that good stuff. But uh, with that, I'll talk to you guys later. You guys have a good one. Have a good 420 and light them up. Don't forget to have that prospect hit the subscribe button and that bell in the upper right hand corner so you will always be up to date with the new channel content. Hi, this is James Hollywood Machikari with Motorcycle Madhouse and I'm here to tell you about the hottest new custom sign business out there, Extreme LED Signs by Jim Vanderlane. Extreme's LED signs specialize in bike club signs, sports signs, business signs, and a whole lot more. Custom crafting by a biker, Jim, he puts his all into whatever project you would like him to do. Visit him on Facebook or give him a call at 585-509-0522. Again, that's 585-509-0522. Rock on! This is 
Ruben Roman, yep, big Des Moines Cycle Tribe Chronicles. Hey, this is Ruben Roman, yep, big Des Moines. 20 years later, seven albums and the same amount of tours, and, and here I am, man. Check out some of these videos of our archives. Get to know us. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We appreciate all your support. We'll see you next time.